So we, we can think about adaptive traits in a range of ways in plants and, and there are some traits that scale fairly readily from molecular level to the sort of whole plant phenotype level, um, which would probably be called simple traits, although they may not necessarily be simple. Uh, whereas I'm thinking more of complex traits that don't scale that well from molecular genetic level to a phenotype level, things like drought adaptation um, and, 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 and the like that are growth and development sort of based rather than things that may be expressed um, simply from gene level to phenotype level like a quality trait or a disease resistance trait. So they're, they're the things I'm, I've, um, I want to focus on. The, the, uh, the issue we have, if I go forward, is that we're sort of drowning in this deluge of, of data, genomic data and phenotypic data. This, this was, I like this, I went to Tasmania recently on a holiday and I went to uh, Mona, the Museum of Old and New Art in uh, Hobart. And it's a great place. And um, not, not at least because it's sort of dug into a cliff under a winery, which is, which is always good. <coughs> but it, it had this installation, which I thought was pretty amazing. And it had this sort of data which was flying down the wall. And it just, you know, it, it is genetic, genomic data. And, so, and you could go and put yourself into this installation. And it just, thought, it just struck me that's, that's where we're at. We've got this amazing ability to capture AGCT and we're drowning in it. And the, the problem we've got is we're sort of starving for insight. We're, we're suffering this sort of starvation of what do we do with all this data? It's not just genetic data, it's now phenotypic data as well because We've got systems that are, enable us to measure uh, everything on plants. We can do hyperspectral imaging. We can shove them in conveyor belts and image them from every direction you like and produce digital data to what's coming out of your ears. And again, for what purpose? Often, we're not sure. And that's not always a bad thing, but it's probably good to sit down and have a think about what do we actually want to get out of this data and are we collecting the right sort of stuff? Do we need what we're after, what we're getting here? And, and this sort of piece of art sort of struck me. This is in the uh, new sculpture garden in Des Moines in Iowa where I go often with the work I've been doing with Pioneer over there. And I thought it was, it was a pretty good image for this point because it's uh, obviously a parody of Rodin's thinker. And the, the guy who did this, I don't know what he was thinking, but I thought it's pretty good to use a rabbit because... Um, it sort of suggests this fleeting level of time that we actually spend on this bit of the end of it, on this end of it, working out the thinking, the insight, rather than the collection of the data. So we've we spend a lot of time collecting lots and lots of data points and probably not enough time really thinking about what to do with it. So I want to try and fill that in a little bit around this topic. So what's the the, uh, the concept of complexity and prediction in crop improvement. I'll go back over that a little bit from discussions from a long time ago with Mark Cooper. Um, concepts of gene to phenotype prediction. Briefly cover that. Look at some ideas of what I mean by functional whole plant ecophysiology and modelling and go over um, crop growth and development framework that we use. Look at opportunities to use that framework in molecular breeding with a couple of examples around um, informing phenotyping and that's the one on uh, root system architecture in sorghum and Vijaya Singh's here and it's a lot of comes out of a lot of the work that she's done in, in my group. And the other one's phenotypic prediction and trait evaluation where we look at going from the other direction instead of going down to a trait and trying to figure out what's going on predict out into the phenotypic space about what it might mean and that's for drought adaptation in maize in the US. And then come back and just try to say, well, so what? Does that fill in any of that insight space? So the first point, and a number of you may have seen this, is one of my sort of slides I use a fair bit, um, in, in thinking about the complexity problem in crop improvement. So for those complex traits that don't scale readily from molecular to phenotypic level. Um, we're, we're really looking at trying to find combinations of genes, 
management practices and environments that give us um, the best outcome. So we're searching this space that we, we can think of as an adaptation landscape. And so uh, this, to a plant physiologist, was all pretty exciting when I started interacting with Mark Cooper and thinking about how the work that we do might fit into this concept of an adaptation landscape. So you, if you think about it, this landscape is really, you know, there's whoops, all sorts of directions you can go in here. So you've got this sort of rugged landscape and you're trying to find a peak. So if you think of this, this is the sort of uh, performance and you may have all different sorts of combinations of genes, environments that will get you onto different parts of this landscape. And to do a, a sort of crop improvement program, you've got to predict where you are, not only predict where you are, but navigate around that landscape and try and find the peak. And then the problem is from one year to the next, it's like an ocean, those peaks will move. So if you go from a, an El Nino to a La Nina, for example, in Australia, you might be in a trough one in one environment and on a peak in another one. So there's a lot of complexity in how you search around this landscape. And so we, we have difficulty predicting and navigating around that landscape and that's really what you need to do in crop improvement. Plant breeders have been doing it for quite a long time but it's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard gig. So this, this problem, we need to be able to predict the phenotype based on where we are in, in, the, in the genotype space. And so we've got this sort of ability now to, to map genomes down to quite fine levels. Um, and if we think of that adaptation landscape, if we look down on it, uh, this, this picture here is sort of showing trajectories wandering around that landscape trying to find the peaks. And these might be from um, selection strategies a breeder might use, making crosses um, of things that perform well in particular environments and trying to search through that landscape to find these peaks. And, and you can get there sometimes. Other times you find a peak that's not, not the extreme one. And so the system, it sort of works, but it's slow and, and inefficient. So I suppose what we're suggesting here is how do we, how, how else might we go about getting to this phenotype? So these are two different types of sorghum, a senescent type that you can see looks sort of dead here and a stay green type which looks nearly dead. But in this sort of drought environment is yielding quite a bit more than this one. So we want to be able to get from how does this connect to this and how do we find it by wandering around the space. And so the argument we're putting forward is to put some concepts of um, ecophysiological concepts that we just capture in a mathematical model in the middle here and that might help us make that, that, um, that trip. And so that's, that's where I'm going. So if we think about it a bit more, you, you've got this sort of um, issue of scales of biological organisation from gene, pathway, cell, organ, plant up to crop. So you've got quite um, a range of levels that one can look at this and various people look at it in different ways. And the, the, the traditional way of doing that with quantitative genetics was to have some gene or a notional version of a gene, measure the phenotype in lots of places and then connect them up with quantitative genetics models. And some statistical way of being able to move from this end of the spectrum to this end and find the phenotypes you want. And, and that worked, but, it, but as I said, it was slow and it still works. There's more modern versions of that now with genetic prediction and uh, genome-wide association sort of systems that help to do that. But we still have this problem of um, phenotypic distance. So what I mean by that is, is, the, is the notion I said before where things that scale directly from this level to this level, you can think of them as having a short phenotypic distance. You, you change an allele somewhere, you change a quality of a grain, um, so you've got a very direct connection. It's a very short space between the genotype and the phenotype, as distinct from something that's a long distance, which has a whole lot of interactions along these levels of organisation before it gets expressed as a phenotype. So 
the, the problem with, with this, this approach, this traditional sort of statistical approach, is that um, you, you get constrained by these context dependencies. And often when students or colleagues ask me questions, what do you think about what will this do in this situation, I, I'm often heard to say it depends because usually it does. It, it depends on what genetic, what other genes you've got in the system, what environment you're playing in as to what the answer will be. So there's never, you know, this plus this gives you that. It, there's always this dependency issue. And this constrains this whole molecular breeding and uh, gene to phenotype prediction space and always has. So one way of trying to get around that is, as I said, to try and bring some, some insight from modelling into this. And there are a couple of ways you can do that. There's been a movement to try to say, well, let's take what every gene does, understand the pathways, put together network models, and work from the bottom up and, and be able to predict the phenotype that way. Um, good luck, I'd probably say. Yeah, I mean, you can probably do it for some things, but, but not very many. The perspective that, that I tend to take on this comes from the phenotype down, thinking about, well, what have we actually got here and what interactions of processes might get us there and then how might this connect back here. But it doesn't get you right back down to the gene level just as this doesn't get you, uh, very rarely will get you up to the phenotype level. So you're, neither of those uh, ways of doing it really solves the, the entire problem. But I want to talk about these context dependencies briefly because they're, they're critical to this. And so um, just to, to reinforce the point about genetic context dependencies, you can see a, a, um, <coughs> a network here for flowering pathways in Arabidopsis. And, and, people, and people do and have done some great work understanding these pathways, but, but they're amazingly complex. They're interfered with by things like transcriptional regulation and, and various, if you perturb one arm of a pathway, um, another one will change its rate and so the whole thing um, is very hard to, to tie down. Um, so I said there, there are some areas where this level of activity is getting to a point where pathway models can be put together to give you expression of things that can start to get you close to some connections to phenotypes, but they're very few. And there's a major knowledge requirement in here. It is a very suitable role for model species like Arabidopsis, but you still end up usually a long way from what a whole plant phenotypic consequence might be. You know, you might end up saying, I, okay, if I run this pathway, I will work out the expression of something, some protein coming out the end here. You've still got to go, well, so what? What does that do to the plant? For the environment context dependencies, it, it's, it's more about interactions with the environment and how the environment might affect the phenotypic consequence of whatever trait you're changing. And so there are a whole range of environmental triggers that might do this and it's where genotype by environment by management interactions come to play. And, and a, a simple example is, is um, uh, a genotype that might have large leaves and grow rapidly um, will be wonderful in a, uh, an environment where there's a high level of resourcing of water and nitrogen, but you put it into an environment where that's not the case and it'll crash. So you, you suddenly get this environment dependency on the performance of, of, of that type of plant. So you can capture these sort of dependencies um, with whole plant crop models because they capture these environmental effects on growth and development. You can start to think about linking aspects of those models, even the coefficients of models to genomic regions, but you still need that, you've still got the issue of scaling from where the model stops back to the, to the gene level. So where I'm sort of heading with this is, is that we need some sort of combination of these things to, to be able to go beyond where we've, where we've been. And if we look at it sort of simplistically, somewhat simplistically this way, um, I'd argue that we can, we can break down some of the context dependencies using this sort of phenotype down 
approach with some eco ecophysiological insight and link it up somehow with the statistical or genetic prediction approaches. Exactly where that connects is a little bit nebulous, um, but I think that's the, the sort of... Um, the, the way we've been trying to tackle this. And I've been thinking for a while about what sort of model we need to be able to do that effectively and, it, and, it's, and it's not your, your everyday crop model. So the, the, the next thing I wanted to, to cover, the third part, was about um, what sort of model do we actually need to maybe do this with. And it comes down to this sort of physiological determinants of crop growth and development. So it, um, and this is a fairly stylistic representation of it, but you can break development down into stages of a, of a plant's life cycle and this is for a, like a determinant cereal. So I mostly work on sorghum, so that's where most of my examples come from, but it can be any determinant cereal, determinant crop but you can do it for indeterminate species as well. Um, and so you can track and predict the progression through the life cycle, through effects of temperature and photo period, water and nitrogen, which will change things like leaf number. And, and the growth and development are fairly independently regulated. On the growth side, you really want to say, what's my accumulation of biomass today, delta biomass today? And we can look at capture of water or capture of light, resource capture and resource use efficiency. So this is transpiration, transpiration efficiency, radiation interception, radiation use efficiency. So how many resources do I capture? How efficiently do I convert them to carbohydrate? And then I can convert that into to grain and predict grain yield. And if I come back into here, I have to figure out how's the canopy growing? What's the leaf area? What's the canopy architecture? Where are the roots? What's the root architecture? How do I actually express um, you know, that, those organs in a way that they capture, capture those um, uh, radiation or, or water? So you've sort of got this resource capture, resource use efficiency way of thinking. Now, that's a fairly stylistic notion. The, the, the way it, it really works is this is still fairly stylistic, but, but it gets you a bit closer to um, what's actually in a crop model. And these are sort of the environmental inputs that drive it. So you need to know what the environment's like. You need to know what the soil's like. You've got some parameters that define what are the basic sort of intrinsic features of a crop. And these are the things that start to get close to genetic regulation. You've got phenology and how that, um, how that plays into uh, leaf area. So you've got to determine the growth of the canopy. You've, you've got to look at the, the growth rate. And again, this is just this resource capture, supply of, on supply and demand for water and light. And you've got to go back to the roots and so on to be able to derive that. And you finally get down to allocation of these things into grain. And the blue bits on, sorry, the green bits on here connect to another layer of this which does the same thing for nitrogen. This is just doing it for carbohydrate. But each of these arrows is actually equations with coefficients that has some sort of conceptual basis in sort of physiological principles about how these things work. So you're looking at the processes that are going on at a sort of plant organ and below level and you're integrating them up to say what happens at the end to yield in specific environments with specific sets of parameters that regulate that crop. So that's sort of how a model works. What, what we then do is, is put that into a clever software platform and fortunately there are clever programmers who do this very well. Um, and, and so this is where APSIM developed and evolved and has been now going for quite a long time, but it, it started out initially um, as, a, as a model to look at cropping systems. And so we had a number of crops. We had a lot of information about the soil, how you manage the crops. I suppose what we've done to it over time is now think about 
Well, if we want to start looking at how to connect our understanding of genetics into this, let's think about these crops in a more generic way. What are the processes by which all these crops operate and how do we connect it back to the, to the genetic regulation? <coughs> so to go into a couple, the couple of examples I want to do, um, it's, it's very important to, to, I think, realise that this isn't just about um, sitting at a computer uh, thinking about how to build a model and how to run it. Um, it's very much connected with experimentation and it actually drives the design of the experimentation and the, the results of that experimentation drive how you put your model together. So it's very important to link this with experimentation and in, in my group that's a lot of what we do and there are lots of postgrads and postdocs that fit in into this space. So we run experiments that are not that conventional in the sense that they're not looking at is this treatment better than that one. We're mostly looking to figure out responses. So here's, for example, accumulated interception, intercepted radiation against biomass for sorghums differing in height. And so we're trying, to under, we're trying to get understanding out of here that quantifies a response that we need in that web for the model. We do things um, in lysimeters to understand water capture, water use efficiency and variation across genotypes, measuring tillering and leaf architecture to understand the dynamics of that and what drives it and how you might predict it. Uh, looking at soil water capture and root distribution to try and get a handle on uh, quantifying that so you can again actually predict it. So it's always trying to get an understanding of this but in a way that you can quantify it so you can predict what might go on. More detailed work on, on measurement of root architecture with Vijaya's work that I'll come back to in a minute. But the, the main thing is about is, is that, that point there. We really want to connect the physiology to the genetics um, through that sort of experimentation. Ultimately, so we can inform precision phenotyping and get towards gene to phenotype simulation. So there's two ways you can go. You can if you understand something enough, you can think about how do I phenotype it so you can then go and measure thousands of them and connect into a, into a breeding context. Or you can think about how do I put this in a model so I can simulate the consequence of changing something in a suite of environments that a breeding program won't be able to sample. And, and both of those things can happen. So we've been playing with that in a few, a few, um, with a few key traits. And I want to talk about the root system architecture one and briefly about the maize transpiration one. And these are the people who have, who have done that work. The, the concept of root system architecture and drought really comes back to a very you know, simple notion of a, of a crop water balance. So here's your crop water balance and all the bits that are going on. So this is just a picture of that at any point in time, but you can think of that as moving through time, as the plants grow and transpiration increases, soil water decreases and uptake decreases and so you've got a whole lot of dynamics going on but you can capture it in this sort of cross section and you can sort of break it down to a sort of identity that's transpiration by transpiration efficiency by harvest index. So this is the mass of grain. So this would be the total mass, this is how much gets into grain so this is a sort of an identity to say that's a very a one-liner of that whole model I was showing you before. And we've, we've done some sort of preliminary simulations with this through work on wheat where there was a suggestion that if we change the root architecture this will have effects on water capture and the effects on water capture integrated over the life cycle. If you change water capture over time you can change this harvest index because you change the amount of water use before and after flowering. And so we started looking at sorghum roots a little bit in a little bit more detail and, and quickly discovered that nobody knew very much about them at all. And so uh, Vijaya did some nice work just looking at how does sorghum root grow? How does it, what happens? And, and so we just did some studies in boxes and 
uh, wash them out. And so these are every expanded leaf stage in a sorghum plant. So six leaves is probably about two weeks um, after it's emerged. And we discovered that you know, you've got this sort of seminal root, uh, a single one in sorghum, some branching of that, but you don't get the main nodal roots appearing until about five leaves have appeared. And these nodal roots are the main things that, that frame the root system of the mature plant. It starts producing those nodal roots. Seminal root will go vertically down and, and sort of be a, uh, a survival uh, sort of capture of water. But the, the nodal roots really frame the, the main part of the root system. But they don't appear until this late. It's quite a bit earlier in species like maize. So in doing this, we're then looking at um, just a few hybrids from David's uh, program. And you know, there was a, an immediate observation that there was quite a, quite a clear difference in, in the angle of these, of these first flush of nodal roots. Um, and so we thought these were very different genetic backgrounds. And, but we thought, well, let's have a look at that. And what are the implications of that? Um, so at least with this experiment, we're able to design a screening system. We know we've got to grow the things to five leaves, so we can't do it in bits of blotting paper like you can do with wheat. You've got to grow it in little um, perspex containers at least that big. And so Vijaya did that. And here's the glasshouse screen where we just, you know, this high-tech phenotyping system, two bits of glass with a a bit of a screw in the middle holding them together and some clips around the outside. Um, and then you take the image of these first flush of nodal roots once the plants get about this big. And when you uh, do a screen for that, the first, ish, the first thing done was to look across a range of diverse materials from the breeding program. And you get a very diverse um, range of root angles. And it's a very highly heritable trait, so strong genetic control. <clears throat> so the, ne the next question though is really, so what does that, does that have any effect on capture of water? So you can change the root architecture around, does it actually um, change the water capture? So we have these large rhizotron systems we have it, um, installed up at Gatton. And so they are about 240 centimetres wide and 120 deep. So there's quite a slab of glass in here. You need a forklift to move these things around. And so we chose some of the narrow and wide angle material um, to grow in these. And when you look at, this is the 20 by 20 centimetre box either below the plant here or out to the side over here. And this is the wide angle type and the narrow angle type. So you can see the narrow angle type, they both have roots in both places. But this one has a lot more below the plant. This one has a lot more at distance from the plant. And, um, and, and that's sort of consistent with the notion of where those major root axes are heading. If you look at the water, at least one thing you can do with this is you take the glass off the front and you can measure the water content of each, each block in here. And if we do that, these are the ones near the plant, the ones uh, about 80 centimetres distant, and the ones um, more distant than that. And the narrow to the wide angle, uh, there's a tendency for more water use of this one near the plant, whereas the wider one has more water use away from the plant. So very difficult to get these things to be significant differences, but certainly the trends were there. Um, and so that's where... Um, more work going on and Vijay is now following this up looking at larger plants with, um, from the studies that we've done before where we know uh, which ones of these will be narrow and wide angle. So here's a, uh, the wide angle plant, narrow angle plant. This is a 120 by 120 centimetre box. These plants are about 30 days old. So um, you can see the much greater proliferation of roots in here compared to this one. 
uh, much greater cluster and a slightly wider angle of these nodal roots here. So if you actually had another box out here, it would probably get more out here. But the point here was mainly this, that there's a, a better capture or a better root distribution below the plant and that was consistent with that slightly greater water capture. So we can, we can sort of take that and say, well, what if we make some bold assumptions about that might give us a few extra millimetres of water if you have that root type versus that one and, and, um, and do, put that into a simulation analysis, which we, which we can do. And, and so you sort of run this narrow, narrow roots relative to standard and what all we did in here was run a, a sorghum model for 100 years of data, um, I forget where we were, Dolby or somewhere, uh, and we say, well, let's just change, let's just give the narrow root one 10 millimetres more water in, that it can access in the profile from below one metre depth. And if you do that, you get simulated results like that, which show, um, you know, 5% or more yield advance for these lower yields and not much effect at the higher yields. So it's sort of in suggesting that, that that would be a useful thing to have. Um, can, we, can we check that out anyway? And this is where the link back into the genetic analysis becomes very powerful. Uh, we, we can do the phenotypic screen and identify the, the QTLs and then come back around and test the association with yield performance from the database in the breeding breeding trials and that's where um, the paper from Emma uh, comes to the fore. So we've got the, um, the architecture, we know um, the parental lines, we've got all these various populations from the breeding, mapping populations, nested association mapping populations and we've got breeding trials. We can identify genomic regions from our phenotypic screen and we can project those on, onto a consensus map. We can then look back at, once we know these regions, um, how do they line up with the performance data that we've got across the breeding trials. You can also go further and start looking at candidate genes and so you get down into uh, more discovery areas. But I'll, I'll, I'll go back this way as to you know, is there a, what's the consequence here? So from Vijaya's screening experiment and the mapping done on that, there were um, four clear regions that explained nearly 60% of the variation in, in this nodal root angle. So there's still a lot of other small effect things going on. But the nice thing here also was that these are, are quite distinct from regions that are controlling um, shoot dry weight and leaf area, so initial vigour of the plant. So the root trait, at least the root angle trait, is quite distinct from, from the shoot traits. So when we run that back over the, the breeding uh, trial data, so we can look at testing the, we know the regions, we can look at the presence of these regions across um, hybrids that are that have been grown in populations in the, in the breeding trials and look for associations with yield as a, as a first indicator of whether those are being, um, have, a, have an association with yield and are being selected for. So the genetic regions controlling root angle, mostly three of the four have significant effect on yield and yield was increased in the presence of that narrow root angle allele. So um, again, pretty useful result. So for this example, we've really got pretty good evidence um, that there's uh, a good association of genetic variation um, with drought adaptation and, and probably operating via root system architecture and water capture. We've got a way of phenotyping for it. I wouldn't call it high throughput, but, it, but it's pretty good. We can probably tweak that. Strong genetic control, marker associations. We've developed that system really um, based around those concepts of using the sort of ecophysiological principles to dissect out a trait and figure out how it might work. Uh, 
we're now in a position to really um, link that with molecular breeding and genetic prediction systems and look at also the design of root systems for phenotypic prediction and we're, we're sort of moving into both of those, those areas. <coughs> the second examples around um, maize and maximum transpiration rate, again a complex drought adaptation trait and this, this relates to uh, transpiration efficiency. So we're looking at the notion of limiting the maximum rate of transpiration during the day of the plant through some hydraulic regulator in the plant and there are various mechanisms by which that can happen. We did some preliminary simulations of this when it was just an idea to see if it might be useful when Tom Sinclair was here on a sabbatic and um, he, he was pretty interested in this, this concept from work he'd been doing in soybean. And, and the idea is really, it's, um, is this one. So you've got, here's your, this is time during the day, here's a normal sort of vapour pressure deficit curve. So the dryness of the air in kilopascals and transpiration of a plant will tend to follow that, well, radiation, vapour pressure deficit are the things that are driving this. And so normal, the normal curve during the day would look like that. And you're sort of saying, well, let's say there's some, some limitation in the plant that doesn't enable it to use that much water in the day. It can't get up to this level of transpiration. It can only get up to here. And there may be various hydraulic limitations in the system. Subsequently, experiments in sorghum have found these sort of differences amongst genotypes. We didn't know that by, by growing genotypes under different vapour pressure deficits and measuring their transpiration rate. Some genotypes just keep responding and so they don't limit their maximum rate. Others um, limit it at a, once you get up above a certain level. So that variation does exist. When we did the simulations initially, here's the uh, fraction of transpirable soil water so fully wet to fully dry and this is days through a crop cycle and the no restricted type just uses up more water uh, whereas the one with a transpiration restriction saves a bit of water and has a bit more water after anthesis and in a, in a terminal drought like this that gives it quite a significant yield advantage. And if we simulate that over sites and seasons and express it as relative yield against yield of the, the standard, the standard here being the one that doesn't have a limited transpiration rate, you can see we we're suggesting quite significant yield advantage up to 20% often at these lower yield levels, although that comes with a yield disadvantage at the high end because when you limit that transpiration rate, you're also limiting photosynthetic rate and so you're not getting as much carbon fixation. So at the moment, where are we? There's good evidence for genetic variation in maximum transpiration rate. We, uh, we have sort of modelling that's suggestive of high phenotypic impact depending on the environment. It depends again. Um, there's an opportunity for developing of a phenotyping system because it's a very hard thing to phenotype for. But perhaps then uh, we can better understand the genetic and physiological control, we can phenotype for it better. And it becomes a strong candidate as a, as a target for molecular breeding and genetic prediction. And, and that's where that sort of work is also going. So just to finish off, so what? Um, th can any of this sort of stuff enhance efficiencies in molecular breeding? And, and really what we're trying to do is overcome that that phenotypic distance context dependency problem. And c can, we, can we crash through that a little bit in a way that, that would make things happen more effectively in crop improvement? So remember I said we've got the sort of notion of a short, short gene to phenotype distance where things scale quite well from a molecular genetic level to a phenotypic level. There may be some use for, for simple models in there but but really a lesser role because you're, 
your heritabilities are high, your, your sort of genetic prediction models work pretty well. Where you get into strife is when you get to this, this longer phenotypic distance. Um, and what we're trying to do is think about how do you overcome some of these context dependencies and, in essence, shorten the distance and use a model to bring you back to something that might be more heritable that you can connect to a genetic prediction. The, the keys to that are, are really around what's in this, this box here. So it, it enables you to break complex traits down into traits that are probably more relevant. And the ecophysiological framework provides the context to do that because that's how plants work. So thinking about root architecture rather than grain yield is probably a pretty useful thing to do in lots of instances, but not all of them. But you can then come back to how do you measure it, what are the genetics for it, and how do you um, get a prediction of that, but also a phenotypic prediction. So not just a, a prediction of that trait, how do you predict the consequence of that into the, into the sort of phenotypic space where you're working. And so this concept of transdisciplinary integration. People who work in this space, there's a lot of geneticists working in this space and so they obviously think very hard around genetics. Um, and when people like me come into this space who think about phenotypes a lot more, um, that it's, a, it's an interesting conversation and I, it took me a while to figure out what they meant when they were calling me a reverse geneticist <laughs> because it, it sort of was a, a foreign concept to them to come that direction. So I, I think there's some new thinking needed in, in how we integrate these different approaches. And um, this is getting to be a bit of an old book now. It's about 10 years old. But I, I really think it's, it's, uh, it's instructive about how to go ahead. And it's about serious, it's called serious play. And it's, it's about serious play with models. And in both the crop modeling context and in the plant breeding context, we have models that you can you can play with strategies about how to change these things and what it means. Breeding strategies, for example, you can't really set up lots of experiments to do those. It's just, they're just too big and take too long. And, and the same with lots of traits in lots of environments. You, just, you can't do it all in the real world. So you can go into the virtual world and play with it. Um, you've just got to be very careful that you don't believe the answers all the time. Um, but it helps you think and it helps you have the conversation with the geneticist and helps the geneticist have the conversation with me. And, and I think that's probably a lot of the biggest value of that. I'd just like to finish by thanking lots of people who, um, who have been involved in this over a fair bit of time. There are some good sort of funding people behind it and, um, and that helps. Um, but certainly the link with, with Pioneer has, has been... Um, has been pretty, pretty good, and and I've spent a number of sabbatics over there with them, and um, and these conversations have, have helped develop these concepts a lot. So thanks very much.